Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. My name is Kasumi Yamashita. I'm an instructor at Stanford's Program on International and Cross-Cultural Education, also known as SPICE. Our program today is titled Indigenous Voices, Educational Perspectives from Navajo, Native Hawaiian, and Ainu Scholars in the Diaspora. Uh, this webinar is presented as a joint collaboration between SPICE and the Center for East Asian Studies at Stanford, CIS, and the National Consortium for Teacher Teaching About Asia, NCTA. I'd like to thank uh, CIS Director, Dr. Daphne Zer, and Associate Director, John Groschwitz, as well as Dr. Clayton Duby, uh, the Director of US USC's uh, US China Institute, which is an, an NCTA coordinating site with, uh, with which SPICE partners. I'd also like to thank SPICE Director Gary Mukai and SPICE Event Coordinator and Instructor Sabrina Ishimatsu for all of their support behind the scenes to make this event possible. And of course, I'd like to thank you for being here today on a national holiday. Just a little bit about SPICE before we begin. Uh, SPICE serves as a bridge between Stanford University, K-12 schools and community colleges um, by developing multidisciplinary curricular materials on international and cross-cultural topics for K-12 educators. Uh, we also offer professional development seminars for teachers um, and teach distance learning courses to high school students in the United States, as well as in Japan, Korea, and most recently, China. Uh, allow me to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm situated on the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish peoples, whose ancestors resided here since time immemorial. Uh, many indigenous peoples thrive here, um, and they are alive and strong. I'd also like to take uh, a moment to acknowledge today, Juneteenth, a national holiday, which commemorates the end of slavery in the United States. It comes uh, as our nation and communities are working to address anti-Black racism and other forms of racial injustice. I find it timely since our webinar today is on ethnic studies. Um, it was prompted by the recent adoption of the California Department of Education's ethnic studies model curriculum, notably chapter three, which includes a section on Native American studies. So today we've invited three Native American and indigenous educators, Dr. Harold Begay, Dr. Rhonda Mapuana Payala Shizuko Hayashi Simpliciano, and Dr. Sachi Edwards, who will share their views on ethnic studies, native studies, indigenous studies in their respective communities. In our first section, uh, they will share their personal stories about their complex native and indigenous identities and cultural backgrounds. In our second section, we'll learn about different understandings of ethnic studies in the continental United States, in Hawaii, as well as in Japan. And in our third section, our speakers will offer insight and takeaways for K-12 educators to create an environment that is more diverse, equitable, and inclusive for our students. The remaining time, will be for Q&A uh, with our speakers. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A function down below. And if you have comments, please use the chat function. Uh, so I will introduce our speakers briefly, but they will elaborate on their identities um, and the importance of names uh, that they use to identify themselves uh, and the relationship that they have to the place places that they call home. Uh, our first speaker, Dr. Begay, is a superintendent of schools in the Navajo Nation in Northern Arizona. He was raised on the Navajo Nation, bound by his traditional Diné, Navajo culture, as well as mainstream Western Greco-Roman education in the United States. He completed his PhD in school finance and economics from the University of Arizona, and began working uh, in uh, several Native American school districts in different teaching and administrative capacities for over 25 years. He's been a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley and is currently 
doing transnational educational work um, here at Stanford. Dr. Sachi Edwards is a faculty member of Soka University, Soka University's Graduate School of uh, International Peace Studies in Tokyo, Japan. Her areas of research include higher education, international internationalization, uh, religious identity, diversity, and oppression. Dr. Edwards received her PhD in higher education from the University of Maryland in College Park. She teaches classes about international and intercultural education, uh, educational theory and philosophy, research methods, and academic writing. Dr. Rhonda Mapuana Payala Shizuko Hayashi Simpliciano is a vice president of a Hawaii Hawaiian Language Immersion School in Honolulu, Hawaii. She is an Ainu Hawaiian scholar and educator who works in the field of indigenous language and cultural restoration. And Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano completed her doctoral work at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. Okay, so let's uh, begin. Uh, Dr. Begay, uh, we'll start with um, some questions about uh, your background. Um, can you tell us about yourself, your, your Navajo heritage, um, and where, where do you call home? And uh, if you could tell us about um, your indigenous heritage uh, while growing up. Okay, there we go. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, my name's uh, Harold Begay. I am again uh, a uh, <clears throat> school superintendent for many years, and uh, I am truly honored to ask to come before you, and certainly a distinct privilege to do so. I uh, want to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, where I'm from, and as I mentioned, I am Native American, Navajo, and in Navajo, <clears throat> I um, have to introduce myself as with Navajo people. We always introduce ourselves with our traditional language, and having been brought up in, in again, our own culture, I am very fluent in my heritage language and certainly my uh, second language, but who am I? In Navajo and Diné, we say Donne. So I'll be speaking in Navajo uh, for a while here to introduce myself. And so I'm speaking my, uh, again, my own language and, and I'm just introducing myself uh, with my matrilineal lineage, my patrilineal lineage, and then the grandparents on both, uh, both uh, the matrilineal side and the patrilineal side. And so relationship is very important in our culture. And so again, I introduce myself in that form. And just to let you know, I just <clears throat> came across my second grade picture there. And <clears throat> I hadn't noticed, but my spouse told me, you have a shiner, a black guy, and being very much excited about uh, baseball, sports, and so on. We used to shag uh, baseball for high school kids, and so somewhere along the line, I, I missed uh, the ball a bit. And so that's my picture. And another picture there as a uh, veteran, Vietnam War veteran with the Marine Corps, and the family members at the Naval Hospital in San Diego with the USMC Marine Corps Casualty Company. And after spending two years in Guam in the Naval Hospital, again, that a horrific experience, uh, having taught me very, uh, very strong discipline 
and that changed my whole life around, having been in the Marine Corps. And then secondly, uh, some of the work that I do conducting and in service for teachers and staff, and certainly at a, a uh, festive school graduation event. And, and again, I uh, went through a credential, uh, my doctorate, PhD in school finance, economics, um, social, bilingual education at the University of Arizona. I worked there for four years at the University of Tucson, Arizona. And after four years, I decided to go out into the fields and to work with real people, real time, what I call real setting. And after, again, having become a bit disillusioned uh, with higher ed. And so I only meant to go out to the field schools for three or four years, but um, I spent over 25 years out in school, different school sites and so on. So essentially that's um, where I'm coming from. And the other thing that I do, we conduct traditional ceremonies, <clears throat> the blessing way, protection way. Those of you who speak Navajo, you know what I'm talking about. And so with advanced credentials, uh, I own, as, as I mentioned, I also conduct, help conduct uh, blessing away and protection away ceremonies and offerings to <clears throat> the various uh, sacred mountains and rivers and what have you. So in short, um, that's who I am. And again, thank you for uh, taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Um, and here again, <clears throat> the Navajo Nation Reservation, there are essentially three layers, just very quickly. We have the Navajo Nation Reservation within the states of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And that reservation essentially is a federal trust land. It's held in trust by the federal government. So there's the boundary there, Navajo Nation Reservation. Within that, we, you know, we also have the Hopi Nation Reservation. So that's one boundary that we, we work with and within. And another set of boundary is the states, uh, the state boundaries of Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado, and Southwest Arizona or Southwest United States. The, four, the third layer of boundary, which is very critical, and this is where I'll be talking as to my presentation, is our traditional homeland. We call it the Netka. And this is within the four sacred mountains. That's what these colors are about, these triangles you see in Colorado, <clears throat> Mount Blanca, Cisnagina, and then near Albuquerque. So it's at Mount Taylor. And to the west, San Francisco Peaks uh, near Flagstaff, Arizona. And to the north, uh, the best uh, the bents, uh, Mount Hesperus in, 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 in Colorado as well. And so these are the four sacred mountains and, and our traditional homeland. So that's uh, where I'm coming from. Thank you so much, Dr. Begay. Um, next we'll hear from uh, Dr. Hayashi Simpusiano. Aloha Kako. My name is Rhonda Mapuana Paya'ala Shizuko Hayashi Simplisiano. I stand on Ko Hawaii Pai Aina, the illegally occupied Hawaiian kingdom that embraced my Ainu ancestors in the late 1800s and early 1900s. My Ainu ancestors came to Hawaii as formerly enslaved people who worked as plantation labor class. Some became indentured servants, others were picture brides who were trying to escape being sold to a brothel. Being an indigenous person of the archipelago that we now call Japan or Dojin meant that you are prevented from having social mobility. Ainu have a history of being enslaved, being forced to be comfort women. And there are Japanese stories saying that we derive from dogs. For this reason, it is never easy for Ainu to disclose Ainu-ness in Japanese spaces and academic spaces infiltrated by the dominant Japanese narrative. I am Ainu. In our language, Ainu means human. In our stories, Apehuchi Kamui, the goddess of the volcano, is the indigenous womb of the Pacific. The genome of my genealogy is estimated to be 50,000 years old. 
you will see the familiarity of our Anchitiri or tribal markings from Hawaii to the indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest. I honor my ancestors, a people of the Pacific who called their home Ainu Moshiri. Today, Ainu Moshiri has been remapped by colonizers to be called Japan and Russia. I am Ainu. I am diaspora, an Aboriginal daughter of the Pacific Seas. And then there is the other me, Hawaii born labeled Japanese, sitting nicely on Seiza knees, make one pot rice, soba buckwheat with ice cold. That's how I eat. Mochi is the gift to receive. My love language is a heart that bleeds. Okage sama de, love, honor, and dignity. The we before the me, Waialua plantation seeds, laborers with little to eat, no slippers to protect the feet, allowed no shade, work through the heat, the opportunities that my grandparents would never meet because they are Ainu labeled Japanese. I introduce my name, but whenever I present in formal academic spaces, I use the name Fuji. Fuji means fire in the Kuril Ainu dialect, and it is a name that belonged to my father before me and my sons Chiono Fuji and Shige Fuji after me. It is a name that signifies my genealogy to Apehuchi Kamui, the goddess of the volcano and fire. And through this name, I bring my ancestors into Western academic spaces with me, knowing that formal institutions of education never were comfortable for my people. But I do this because I believe the world can benefit from, the, from our ancestral knowledge. Academia calls my ancestors hunter-gatherers, but I want my children and I want my students to know that my ancestors were masters of phenomenology and meticulous collectors of qualitative data who documented the world around them through art and orality. As an educational researcher, my name Fuji signifies my genealogy to traditional ways of knowing and feeling and academic excellence. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Dr. Edwards? Hi everyone, um, my name is Sachi Edwards, as uh, you've been told already. Um, I am speaking to you also from uh, the illegally occupied nation of Hawaii, um, although I am also um, uh, employed in J Tokyo, Japan. Uh, so I am sort of representing that space as well. Although I was uh, born and raised here um, in Hawaii, and, and I am also a descendant of the um, labor class labeled Japanese um, uh, here in Hawaii. Um, I have some pictures to share. So I, like uh, Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano, um, um, and I knew descendant, uh, but my experience is slightly different from hers in that I was not raised um, my whole life with this knowledge of my ancestry. And it was something that I learned in adulthood. Um, my Ainu ancestry comes from my grandfather who uh, you can see here on the top images. Um, on the top left uh, is a picture of him in his prime. Um, the middle top photo is a picture of Machiavelli in on Kauai Island, which is uh, where he was raised, where he uh, was raised on the plantation that his family lived on and worked on. Um, and this picture of him on the right, the top right, is actually how I remember him the most. He, throughout my whole life, spent every day, all day uh, working in the garden. Um, and he had just such an amazing gift for uh, growing and cultivating things. Um, it's, I currently live in this house that's pictured in that picture. And I spend as much time as I can um, in that garden, uh, trying to maintain his legacy. Um, as you can see on the pictures uh, on the bottom, on the bottom 
left is my mother, uh, my grandfather's daughter, obviously, and my brother. Um, and I, I put their picture here because, you know, my mother is obviously my connection to my grandfather and my brother had such a tight relationship with my grandfather and I feel like he embodies my grandfather's spirit in so many ways. Um, he also uh, has inherited that gift of working the land the way that my grandfather uh, did. Um, in that center picture, you'll see that uh, a little photo of my grandfather that I keep in a frame. Um, I have that in my home wherever I live, uh, but that particular picture was a frame uh, from my wedding ceremony that I brought him with me uh, to make sure that he was there. Um, the picture just before is a small tangerine tree and that's significant to me because I planted that tree in his garden uh, with the placenta of my youngest son who I named after him. And my youngest son is pictured uh, in this blue onesie and my older son is actually uh, pictured in the bottom uh, right corner. And uh, both of these pictures are actually taken uh, near my grandfather's uh, uh, gravestone. Um, and I think, I think this is important because it's been such an important part of my life as a mother, uh, making sure that they remember or that they know him, you know, uh, they, he was passed by the time they were born, but it's very important to me uh, for them to know him. And, you know, I, even at, as young as, uh, uh, you know, a few months old have been uh, introducing uh, my grandfather to my children. So this is sort of part of my story. Um, and as I said, I, you know, didn't always know about my Ainu ancestry. And so my uh, ability to uh, speak about Ainu culture is, of course, limited. Um, but I think that the my experience is not uncommon for Ainu in diaspora because of the fact that um, our ancestors, you know, my great grandparents uh, who came uh, from Japan uh, were uh, told not to uh, disclose their Ainu identity. And so it was something that was a source of shame uh, for many Ainu in diaspora. And so my story is not uncommon. We know many uh, Ainu in diaspora who, like me, have learned as adults and are now building community with each other and um, trying as best we can to uh, learn more about our history um, and to connect with Ainu in Hokkaido. Um, and certainly not to uh, speak over them or to make uh, make ourselves uh, to present ourselves as if we can speak on their behalf because we cannot and obviously our experience is different. But like I said, my experience and, and the experience of many I know in diaspora who are in my position is not uncommon. And it's something that is the result of um, these decades uh, or centuries, generations of oppression of Ainu people, um, which has sort of forced some of these oral stories, family stories uh, under, um, into sort of the shadows. And we uh, in this generation are doing our best to uh, bring out those stories again and make those connections again. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Edwards. Um, all your identities are such a strong component of your lives, your education, research, and the schools in which you work. Um, Dr. Begay, could you tell us um, a little bit about the state of ethnic studies um, in Navajo Nation and how uh, ideas of diversity um, equity and inclusion are uh, incorporated in your schools? Uh, yeah, I'm... Um, 
I'm trying to get my uh, video going here. I don't know if, you, if all of you can hear me, but uh, okay. Hmm. <clears throat> my uh, video is not going, but I, I think I don't know if all of you can hear me. Yes, we we could hear you, Doctor. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, on that particular question, the state of ethnic studies in your community, I, I'm going to be talking a bit from within the four sacred mountain, within the traditional homeland. I will not be talking from the standpoint of the federal reservation standpoint, if you will, or even the state, the state that we're in. But uh, my comments are really coming from within the four sacred mountain. And uh, what I've done is I have, I do actually have a book in progress that stems from what I call the consequentialist frustration with limitations, limitations in the state of ethnic studies or Native American studies. There's a huge gap, gaping hole in there. And what I want to do is uh, to bring to surface <coughs> the, <coughs> Instructive, instructive power of the deeper level, what I call deeper level thought inherent in the epistemology and ontology of at least the one Native American, the philosophical constructs of the Navajo. And uh, I'm going to be talking again how traditional epistemology, epistemology meaning the structure of of knowledge, uh, how knowledge is uh, placed together. And ontology here, again here, in academic format, um, the ontology is what we see all around us, the earth system, the Hassan ground, Mother Earth, that reflects our traditional homeland within our four sacred mountain, the natural order geographic foundation. So that's again, the ontology. I'll, I'll be talking a bit about that and then how we derive from that the epistemology, how we structure our knowledge, our sacred knowledge and knowing and teachings, and how the, we were able to construct uh, philosophical construct, constructs and as a means, a means to uh, strengthen, strengthen our sense of cultural selfhood, cultural selfhood, and certainly cultural identity. And so this is what I find missing in so much of our Native American studies. And, and uh, so I decided to work on that with my background in professional, my professional background in psychology counseling and now conducting, um, conducting a sacred ceremonies, helping with that. And, and so that, that's uh, pretty much what I'm working on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano. Aloha. So Hawaii is in a much different position, I think, than, uh, say, California or Arizona when it comes to ethnic studies. We don't have any uh, mandates or policies in place for K-12 ethnic studies. Um, I work in a Kulakaya Puni, which is a Hawaiian language and immersion school. I'm a Hope Pookumu or vice, vice principal. So I work really closely um, with teachers. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm really concerned about is how we prepare teachers um, to be welcoming of various cultural identities in classrooms. Um, and, you know, and I say this because Hawaii is a very interesting state in that our native language, our mother tongue, Hawaiian, legally um, is, is supposed to be, um, uh, you know, it is, a, it, is a, it is a legal language, right, just as English is. And I believe Alaska is the only other state with that um, law in place, right, but we're, we don't... Um, Hawaiian is not normalized in classrooms in Hawaii, right? Only two, about 2% 2 of the population actually speaks Hawaiian in Hawaii, and that's probably not fluent. So how do we get um, 
to classroom teachers ready and willing to normalize native knowledge. Um, and so Dr. Edwards and I um, have been using our Ainu positionality and we've created a model called the Moshiri model, which uses Ainu epistemology to normalize you know, um, native ways of knowing and feeling, which have to incorporate what in the English language you would call spirituality. And for us, that's just the essence of things that are non-human, non you know, the physical, uh, uh, non-human physical. Um, but they, they absolutely, in our ways of knowing and feeling, um, impact our humanity. So we have Kamui Moshiri, which is where divine knowledge would come from. We have Ainu Moshiri, which is the plane in which we currently stand on. And we have Pokna Moshiri, which is the plane of the ancestors. And from the Ainu epistemology, these planes are happening, um, interacting with each other in real time, all the time, constantly. And so, you know, we are trying to challenge ourselves knowing that, you know, coming from the positionality of settler, of Asian settler. And by the way, for me, settler is not a bad word, right? For me, I aim to not be a colonizer. I aim to be somebody who is on um, native land, who settles and recognizes that the ancestral knowledge of that land should really be front and center, right? And so we're, we're trying to use our Ainu epistemology, worldview, and our histories of being oppressed to try to be good settlers for positive action, right? And so in the Moshidi model, we have questions that kind of align to these different Moshidi or planes to challenge us as educators to be reflective. Because as we're getting into these ethnic study standards, there's no one teacher that can be it all. There's no one teacher that can know it all. But we should be sensitive and have a deep reflection and, and reflexive relationship with our positionality for the native people on the lands in which we stand, right? So yes, I'm part Kanaka Maoli in, in Hawaii, but if I go and I am teaching in California or I'm teaching in Arizona, or we're doing this Zoom and we have mm -hmm. students across the nation, I am not gonna have the knowledge of the native people on those lands. So I use the Moshidi model to think about my genealogy, right? What is my genealogy to place? Um, who are the people of that place? before me? What did they believe? What is my source of spirituality? How do I know what I know? And so essentially for me, this is how I try to incorporate um, my Ainu epistemology in my everyday practice. So whether I'm doing ethnic studies or indigenous studies, or we're doing lessons in the Hawaiian language, or we're doing lessons in the English language, for me, my practice, my pedagogy, it is my Ainu worldview. Thank you so much. And Dr. Edwards, in your case, uh, context is slightly different. Uh, in Japan, ethnic studies is not the um, same as in the United States. What is the state of ethnic studies um, in Japan? Um, and uh, are ideas of diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion also incorporated in the classroom? And, uh, and if so, in, in what ways? Yeah, I'll preface this by saying that I'm not a K-12 teacher in Japan, so I don't necessarily have expertise about what's happening in that area. But based on what I know and the work that I do um, in the higher education level, I'm certainly working with Japanese students who have just come out of the K-12 system. What I understand is that any discussions about ethnic diversity in Japan is is assuming that the di ethnic diversity comes from international international uh, citizens of other countries. Uh, the assumption there being that Japanese nationals are ethnically homogenous, which of course is not true. Um, but in, in that sense, the uh, discussions about uh, ethnic studies or ethnic diversity is, is extremely limited. Um, but what I can say um, is that 
you know, as uh, Dr. Hayashi Simplesiano said that, you know, no matter where we are and no matter what students we're working with, you know, it's really important for us to be, as, as uh, educators, to be aware of uh, all of the various genealogies that we bring with us, not only uh, familial genealogy, but also genealogies of knowledges. So how, how do we know what we know, as, as uh, both of the other speakers have said, but also uh, in a familial sense, but also, you know, our academic training, where has that come from? How has that shaped what we, what we understand? Uh, what sort of um, uh, biases, I would say, or what, folk, what sort of focus have we had in, in our studies in terms of what sort of, what histories we um, have come to understand as important or perhaps even universal. Um, and the point really being that these stories um, uh, and the approach to ethnic studies, it really should be personal, right? No matter if you uh, personally um, have native heritage, indigenous heritage uh, to the place that you're uh, physically located or anywhere else, uh, you know, you are tied to that place somehow because you are there. So it's important for you to make the story of you being there a personal one and for you to make the story of the, the indigenous people of the of that land where you are to make that a personal one to tie yourself and your own history to that space. Um, which is how you know which is what our Moshiri model attempts to do is to try to offer these guiding questions to help teachers or, or anyone really. Um, do the sort of reflective work to think about who are they, how did they get to where they are, and what is their responsibility uh, based on their unique uh, positionality, their unique uh, genealogical background, their unique story of how they uh, arrived to where they are. To what extent do you think your students are aware of Indigenous histories in uh, in Japan, whether it's Ainu or um, Ryukyu uh, her cultures, culture? Yeah, I think uh, it's a mixed bag. Some students are very aware. Other students before they uh, enroll in my class are not so aware, but certainly by the end of, of the class with me, they are aware. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I think that that's an important one for, uh, it's important for me to tell that story and to have that conversation with them and, and uh, maybe open their uh, minds and, and hearts uh, to, that, to that story. So, but they've all been very receptive, um, which has been a pleasure for me. And certainly there are more, uh... Uh, magazines and books and popular culture that allow for students to learn about, understand and accept, maybe recognize in their own heritage. Um, sure, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, getting back to Dr. Begay, um, could you offer teachers, K-12 teachers, um, something that uh, um, they can take into their classrooms. Um, like, how can we recognize, um, how do they recognize and honor the cultural heritage of the students in, in their classrooms? Um, and the, the biases that we talked about earlier, um, how can we reflect on our own biases um, as we move forward and and how in what ways can we make our classrooms more inclusive uh, to all students yeah, yeah. Um, I'm hoping that all of you can hear me is my video still out here I'm not sure why but uh, I'll very quickly on that it's so important to establish establish a uh, <clears throat> relationship with students, a very positive uh, relationship, uplifting relationship. 
and, and so to get the students to trust you, to begin to respect you, and uh, to have some real confidence uh, in you. Uh, so that relationship is critical. In Navajo, we call it ke. And so that is so critical. But on that, how can we do this uh, DEI, diversity, um, again, inclusion, equity? How can we bring that into the classroom of what I'm talking about? Again, my, my comments are coming from within the within the four sacred mountains, within our traditional homeland. And I'm going to address that more with a question now. How can we bring all of that into the classroom? The only thing I can say is we're looking up, we are looking up at a huge, steep, steep mountain. There is virtually uh, no literature I'm aware of that will do that, that will express our true authentic identity from within the four sacred mountains. That's what I'm working on. So just very, very quickly, I'm gonna go through some information that uh, some uh, research data that I've, I've uh, garnered on my own. And so this, is, this has to do with, again, coming from the, within the four sacred mountains, the Dine spirituality. I point out that it does encompass an extensive academic content. So uh, traditional Dine knowledge is not um, myth or superstition or legend or what have you. It's far, far more than that. For, uh, uh, our spirituality, our teachings, our knowledge. And it, it, if you, I did a comparative analysis with uh, the conventional academic uh, profiles, and I find that within Navajo, there's a extensive content in Navajo traditional knowledge that parallels psychology. The post-humanist behaviors, the phenomenological schools of thought, that even goes so far as uh, the neuromorphology, the neurosynaptogenesis, and the neuroplasticity, cognitive neuroscience. And since that's my background as well, I did some writing on that, contributed, contributed a chapter on that in one book. And we get into the ontological, epistemological philosophy, the speculative, analytic, description, pres prescriptive philosophy. It gets into the mathematical, what I call formulation of quantum physics theory. It gets into the coherent or the, the pattern, the balance, harmony in mathematics. And we find in that philosophy, again, at the crux of classical Western mind-body dualism, mind over matter argument. For these reasons, the Navajo, they, really, they have a very, a trivia, very important uh, sacred uh, focus on that. And so I ask who is going to bring that into a classroom? No one. And that's what I'm putting together. And so in, for academic discourse at this point, uh, I'm talking about knowledge from within the four sacred mammoth, the, the most peripheral level. We don't get into the core knowledge of Navajo thought, uh, the authentic traditional knowledge. And But uh, my point here is some of the things I want to point out, the concepts of interconnectedness, interrelationship, and Navajo thought with uh, our environment, the ontology, and the business, they play heavily, heavily into enlightenment. It gets into the ever-evolving, what I call quantum theory and physics. So in this discourse on that whole thought philosophy, right now I can say there are two constructs that come immediately to mind that are most applicable from quantum physics theory. These are uh, coming from research. And one, what we call in that whole, the, and, and there's a huge connection with the superposition particles of nature, again, from quantum physics, where we place a, uh, a laser-like focus on one particle and emit this random swirl of particles. And if we do this sort of laser-like focus, this results in a collapse of all the contextual random swirl of particles. And secondly, there's something called quantum physics of duality. And in that whole, that's approximating that something cannot 
exist without the other. So there is a nature and mutually dependent opposites that takes on remarkable properties of uh, balance, cohesion, harmony. And in that, oh, there's a term for that. They call it a chance of luck that come, uh, comes together. And, and so much of this, um, again, is non-existent, yet it's traditional verbal knowledge. And, and I'm trying to put all of this into a uh, book format so that we can begin to truly place on the table in American education the true authentic knowledge of Native people, at least from a Navajo standpoint. So that, in a nutshell, is, is essentially what I'm doing. Thank you so much, Dr. Begay. Um, Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano, how, how about in the context of Hawaii, how, how, can student, how can your students learn about their own genealogies and um, and how could we help them uh, learn about uh, their heritage? I think that's one of the strengths of the, the, Kayapu, the Kayapuni framework. Um, you have to understand that, you know, we're not doing ethnic studies. We are doing heritage restoration. So our kids come in, they're completely immersed in their native language and, and we do the best that we can to immerse them in native culture. Um, so I, you know, I really feel strongly that it starts with school leaders, it starts with administrators, it starts with teachers doing this work first, right? To really understand um, and do reflection on their practice and where their practice falls intergenerationally. Um, and when you do that work, you know, it makes it a safer space. And when you come to that understanding within yourself, it makes it a safer space for your students. We have to understand that many of our native students are coming in with generations of historical trauma around not speaking your native language. We have to understand that this is the same with our immigrant students as well, right? Our, of our students of the diaspora. So for myself, if I don't really dig in and do the work for, for me, see, I feel like as professionals, we need to work to make space for other native and indigenous professionals to step in. And, and you know, when we have colleagues that we know that are indigenous that really embrace an indigenous pedagogy, we need to be standing up for them. We need to be sticking up for them. We need to create space for them. If we don't have that, we need to be working with our administration to bring knowledge keepers into the classroom. It's okay to not know it all, but it's important to do that reflection to understand that you don't know it all. What is your relation and what is your, your, your position right, to a place and to the people and to your students? And for me, that's the important work that has to start with the teacher first, because for generations, it was not safe for my family to be in school. And I think that that shows I'm first gen. I'm the first college graduate of my line, right? My father was the first high school graduate. Before that, you stayed on the plantation and you worked. There was no time for school. But school was also not a safe place. The Ainu word for school, Ipakushnuchiste, is also jail, right? And so that tells you what the Ainu perceived of school. But my ancestors were brilliant. They were brilliant scientists. Um, and the problem is we're often not in those positions to be documenting these stories, right? And so one of the most powerful things that we can do as teachers and educators is to do that work ourselves so that we are comfortable facilitating that environment so students can dig into their genealogy and feel safe about it and share their stories, right? And then share even the challenges within their history because in, the, in that challenge, there's narratives of resistance. Right? And so I always say that it's most important for me as a Kanaka Maoli working in Hawaiian language restoration, I have to dig into my Japanese genealogy. I have to go back to that time where my grandparents and great grandparents were told they can only speak Japanese. They cannot speak Ainu. When they came to America and they were navigating World War II, right? everything was not even speak English, speak American, speak American having an American mentality, giving your children an American name, like Rhonda, right? And so I carry this historical trauma with me 
And so in order to be an effective educator of Native children, I have to deal with that positionality first before I make the classroom safe for them. Thank you so much. In, uh, in your case, Dr. Edwards, um, with your students, how do you, how do you make these uh, in, you know, indigenous stories relevant to, um, to, the, to your students? How can you make them, uh, how can you have the stories connect uh, to the students? Yeah, I think that, you know, if I draw on what uh, Dr. Begay and Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano have said, and to point out that what they're saying is that indigenous studies is not, it should not just be in ethnic studies, like relegated to a specific subject, right? Indigenous studies should be in all subjects because indigenous peoples have developed systems for creating knowledge in the sciences, in math, in arts, in, in literature and language, in, in all types, of, in, in psychology, in, in all fields, in all areas. So I think that understanding uh, the history of indigenous uh, communities, uh, the active uh, presence of indigenous communities is is an important thing to include in all subjects. So for instance, I teach currently in a uh, peace studies program, which is designed as a global citizenship program. Um, and so, you know, perhaps you might say, oh, but you're talking about global citizenship, you should be thinking internationally. But I tell my students, but no, you know, at one point, not too long ago, Hokkaido, which is where um, most Ainu um, communities that are still thriving today uh, reside, was not part of, was not considered part within the, the borders of Japan, right? And so national political boundaries, uh, borders are largely, irre are, are largely irrelevant um, because the point, uh, if you wanna like think about what global citizenship um, education, what its goals are, and really, to be honest, what the goals of ethnic studies are is, is really just to help people understand that um, people see the world fundamentally differently than they do, right? And that doesn't necessarily have to mean studying folks in Europe or elsewhere around the world. It can mean studying other communities that are within technically your legal country uh, borders, right? So, so we do address, we do speak about Ainu issues in my class. Um, and I tell them that that's precisely for that reason that it's important for you to learn about other ways of knowing, um, other ways of uh, arriving at uh, an understanding of the natural world, of the human world. Um, because the Western European way of doing that is not universal. It is culturally specific. Um, it's not less or more relevant than uh, ways of knowing from other communities, but it should be understood sort of equally. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that it's important to include um, lessons about uh, indigenous communities, but also lessons that utilize indigenous knowledges um, in any subject, whether you're teaching science or math or art or uh, reading or, you know, whatever you're teaching. I think that it's important to draw on uh, indigenous peoples who uh, have been perpetuators of the knowledge in those specific fields. Um, and not just limit it to ethnic studies uh, as as a you know specific uh, course subject. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to move over to um, address some of the questions that have come in, um, and uh, feel free to jump in and answer uh, freely. Um, one question talks about. Um, 
ways of healing, ways of community healing. Um, the question, mm -hmm. can you talk about blessing ways and how they work in community healing? Uh, yeah, I think that was directed uh, at me. I'm not certain, but the mention from Lisa Gibson um, mm -hmm. can you talk about blessing ways and how they work in community healing. <clears throat> There are uh, extensive blessing ways slash protection way prayers and songs, sacred songs in that. And uh, this is not only for an individual, but it, it is for essentially everything. Uh, not only a person, a family, but um, for example, our home or house or hogan, it's it's uh, viewed as almost like a church, like a cathedral. It, the home is very sacred and there are very sacred songs for the home. There are sacred songs for your material goods, sacred songs for your job, sacred songs for your livestock, horses and what have you, sacred songs for your cornfield, whatever plant you make. So there's an, a, an extensive amount of, um, again, uh, um, sacredness uh, on, attributed or for all, all of this. And I am I'm not sure how I can assist in this respect, uh, in this regard, uh, to do a, Blessing way and, and community healing. So there's blessing way again, even for your people, for your community, uh, uh, and so for your nation. So, so the Napo spirituality is is again very very sacred and of, of, of great depth. And so I, I just wanted to, to uh, mention that. Um, uh, how about? Uh, transgenerational trauma, for example, as a result of colonialism. Um, yeah, very quickly, the same thing there. Any type of trauma, um, there are protection way and blessing way for those. There are ceremonies for that, any type of trauma that one may go through. And here again, it gets the blessing way essentially gets back to what I mentioned earlier. It has to do uh, with uh, bringing yourself what I call kind of like doing an alignment with your vehicle. You have to maintain your vehicle, keep it, take care of it, you know, maintain it. And I tell people we're not any different. You have to align yourself with the harmony, with the balance that exists in nature. All the, the Mother Earth, the celestial bodies are in perfect order. And our bodies, our mind, our spirit are not any different. And so there are powerful language and words in that whole that realigns you uh, and gets you back um, again in harmony with the natural order of things all around. And so in your body, in your in mind, body, and spirit. And, and, and so this applies to everything. So essentially it, it, it's that. Um, Dr. Hayashi Simposiano, how about uh, undoing the harm done to say grandparents, like language erasure? Could you talk a little bit about how to address trauma or? Um... Well, you know, the thing that comes to mind is Dr. Begay was talking about harmony in the context of the Navajo um, cultural lens. You know, I start thinking about harmony in the context of the Ainu cultural lens. And for the Ainu, balance was the key to everything. And you'll see that in our Anshipiti. You'll see that in our tribal marking, right? And you'll see that in our tattoo on our hand. Each had a distinct tattoo that was in relation to balance, right? And it was a reflection. It was like a spiritual amulet um, as well as reflection of the woman's genealogy. And I bring this up because when we're talking about ethnic studies and diversity and equality, right? It's so important for our kids to have this education as well as our teachers, because what then do we think of, say, uh, a school administrator or a teacher with a tattoo or piercing, even if it's cultural, 
not for Western fashion, right? So for myself, I often wear a labre piercing, which is for my people, for the Kuril Islands people, was very important. It means that I am a woman that has grown into understanding the weight of my words, right? But I would not do this in, say, an academic setting because it doesn't feel safe, right? Though it, it, it gives me a, a spiritual cloak, right? And so I bring this up because as we're talking about ethnic studies, as we're talking about Indigenous studies, we as a professional learning community have to really embrace this because how can we ever really fully achieve equality if we're not fully accepting of these weights, right? So we're talking about healing historical trauma and we're talking about healing, um, you know, this, I, this, this intergenerational rift that has happened you know, due to language and being removed from land and being removed from culture. Uh, you know, it's important that those of us that are working in this field of education, we make sure that we stand up for our students that are embracing their cultural identities, whatever, whatever that may be. And I just want to share this real quick. We recently had a conversation with an, uh, an Ainu elder in Hokkaido. And she had shown us a picture of her grandmother who wore her traditional tribal markings, right? And she told us she's, she, was, she has anxiety even when her husband sees that picture, that she feels like she needs to hide that picture and that her grandmother was forced to wear a mask in public because it is against the law to show your tribal markings in public, right? For myself, I have almost identical story where my second great grandmother was basically thrown into a corner cloaked so that people just thought she was, you know, deaf, dumb, and mute because of these tribal markings, right? And this is a, this is a symbol of our, our knowledge and our ways of harmony and balance with nature and our genealogy. And this is the type of shame that colonialism has instilled around these practices. And so, um, yeah, I just want to say that, you know, so as for myself, as, as an educator, as an Ainu woman, it's not easy to embrace these practices. It's, it, but it's something that I, you know, strive and aspire to do to obtain that healing within my own family's genealogy, right? But I mention this because it's important as your deal is your is your teaching ethnic studies or indigenous studies to really do that reflection and think about the ways in which we're building a school community and are our environments truly safe for indigenous students that truly embody Indigenous spirituality. Thank you. Here's another question um, directed at Dr. Edwards. Um, she writes, Dr. Edwards, I was wondering how what Dr. Begay was saying relates to Indigenous science, specifically how words in songs are part of the oral tradition and communicate knowledge. Yeah, so I think what comes to mind when um, when I see or hear that question is the idea that, you know, in Western um, understanding would have us think that alphabetic literacy is the primary most evolved form of literacy. Um, but there are other forms of literacy, right? There's visual literacy, there's oral literacy. And entire traditions develop around maintaining oral tradition um, that are just as strong as alphabetic literacy. And you might, you know, if you're coming from an oral tradition, an oral literacy perspective, you might look at alphabetic literacy and find weaknesses in it, in, in that it uh, uh, weakens your reliance on your memory. And so memory becomes. Um, a muscle that you don't exercise, right? But when you have uh, oral tradition, you know, entire cultures and rituals evolve or uh, develop around uh, building that uh, capacity or that, that memory muscle uh, to maintain those stories. And so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that is, that's what comes to mind when you, when you ask specifically about uh, words uh, and how they pass on through songs or chants or, or whatever else uh, through orally uh, pass down indigenous knowledge in that sense. Um, but, you know, uh, relating to indigenous science more generally, you can recognize that, you know, 
similarly to the ways that there are multiple forms of literacy, there are multiple forms of, of doing science and, and, and coming to an understanding of the natural world. And so, um, you know, the, the Western worldview might have uh, suggests that there uh, takes on sort of a positivist approach, right? The identify uses empirics to identify one single truth that is universal. Uh, whereas indigenous science asks us to develop a deeper relationship with a particular element or phenomenon in order to, to understand it better, not to just read about it and say that we understand it, but to really develop a relationship with it. And that, that, understand, that knowledge is highly contextual. Um, and so uh, there's no assumption that it's universal. Uh, and so when you encounter someone else with another, uh, uh, another story, uh, another uh, uh, form of knowledge that was developed around a particular issue, you're able to then uh, communicate with that person and learn from each other as equals, uh, rather than thinking of your own way of understanding something as being universally true. Um, so yeah, that's how I would answer the questions about indigenous science. Thank you. Um, I have another question here um, directed at Dr. Begay along the same similar lines. Um, question is, I would be interested in hearing your reflections on how you navigated cross-culturally between your traditional Navajo cultural upbringing and your experience in Western educational institutions. So how do you balance two, uh, two worldviews as, yeah. as you were growing up? Yeah, uh, it, it's like we're talking about um, orange and apple. Everything is contextualized. It has to be contextualized. And so, for example, in the Western education, I affiliate, I, I by choice, uh, uh, began affiliation with the very best in Western education, the universities. Um, uh, visiting scholar to Berkeley, uh, excuse me, but um, as affiliation with Stanford and um, with Navajo tradition, affiliation with uh, highly regarded, highly respected uh, spiritual practitioners, those who conduct ceremonies. So uh, it's the environment that makes a crucial difference. What kind of environment you put yourself in and so whenever i am in this kind of environment for example right now what we're doing i put my whole world my whole focus in this discourse an academic discourse and once we get off of this then i put my whole world into our tradition at home here and and so uh essentially that that's kind of um, pretty much uh, what I do. And I, as I mentioned, if you want to be the very best, you have to be the very best, uh, affiliate with the very best. So be careful who you affiliate with. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Here's a question for um, Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano. Have you done work with Ainu in the diaspora in countries besides the United States that have significant Japanese populations such as Brazil and Peru? That has been a blessing, I think, of COVID-19 because um, so Sachi and I are both founding members of the Ainu and Ainuic Heritage Education Society. Um, and because of COVID-19, we were able to partner with Japanese American Memorial Privilege, uh, Pilgrimages, and we were, we were, um, we've been able to do Ainu live streams and through social media, Ainu from all over the world. And so, you know, previously, you know, years ago, my grandfather said, you know, where you find a, a high volume of Japanese immigrants, you're gonna find Ainu people. And so I believe that there were Ainu in Brazil, but you know, I'm from a little small plantation town in Hawaii, I, I, I didn't know anybody. Um, but through social media, we're meeting um, 
I knew that are in Brazil. We're meeting I knew that are in Central America. So, you know, there are I knew diaspora all over the world. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Could you tell us a little bit a little bit more about this um, transnational network that you're creating? How can how can I knew in the diaspora become more engaged um, with your organization? Sure. So if you um, you know if you would like to reach us, you can go up on Facebook, look uh, and look under I knew in diaspora. Um, from there, if you need to like message me personally, you can reach me through that page. That's public. A private page that we have is the Ainu Nainua Heritage Educational Society. Um, and that's really to provide information and exchange ideas with other Ainu and Ainu allies. Um, so social media has been great in that it has been a, a, a tool for us to um, really connect with each other. You know, it's very interesting, right? Because as a diasporic community, um, we have a very opposite experience from what um, Dr. Begay is describing, right? And so for me to see a native superintendent, I'm just mind blown, right? To hear about his experiences and to, to learn about what's happening um, in, in, in his school, right? So as a, as a Kanaka Maoli, you know, I can't, I can't even think of, and I've tried to do some research to find, I don't think we've ever even had a Kanaka Maoli superintendent. As I knew people, um, you know, it is very, you're very lucky to even find an, an I knew person who is in, you know, Japanese formal education um, systems as a teacher, let alone a school administrator. Um, as somebody that works at a Hawaiian language and immersion school, I've done exchanges where I knew students have come down to our school to, to look at what we're doing and the work around cultural restoration. And they've just been blown away that I'm a female and I'm openly Ainu in administration, right? And so presence is very um, important. And so um, one of the hardest things for Ainu is visibility because we've been told to hide our identity for so many generations. And so, you know, I think Dr. Edwards for being so brave and being, you know, out there with me and other I knew as well. Um, and because I think that the more we're visible, the more people feel safe to, to share their stories with us. This uh, is another question for, for you and Dr. Edwards. Could um, you say something about the role of art, music, chant, dance, in either Ainu culture or Native Hawaiian culture? Do you use these in your teaching? So I'll, I'll go first with that. I think that you can kind of tell by my introduction that um, you know I, I call myself a hip hop pedagogue and I use stories. It's a deep part of my, my pedagogy um, and storytelling and poetry in sharing my stories through that form. That's a very Ainu thing to do. And what I say is, you know, growing up, we did not have our native language. I had hip hop, right? And when you look at hip hop, which comes from African diaspora culture, there are things that are very similar to the way you would traditionally share orality when it comes to Ainu culture. As an example, with Ainu, we have a practice of charanke, which is argument. So I grew up very naturally as a, as a hip hop battle MC and battle rapper. And this was something that was, was you know, I, that I feel was actually very cultural from, from, from the Ainu standpoint, right? Um, and so now as I'm growing older, and I th I, I, I've been able to get connected with elders in my community, um, so that hip hop lens was the first thing that was developed, but it's opened my mind to the ways in which I knew story share in native language and the ways in which I'm also um, a hula dancer um, training to be in Olapa. So, you know, very serious traditional hula kahiko or ancient hula, right? And there are things that are very similar as well. Um, and so through rhythms and orality and chant, we say music now, but this is how our our oral histories have been passed down and kept alive despite colonialism, despite oppression, 
despite the removal of our, our native language, right? We've had this music. Um, and so even if somebody is not fluent in the Ainu language, they'll remember these songs. Or even if somebody's not fluent in the Hawaiian language, they'll remember these, these songs and dances. Um, and so it's been a way for us to um, sustain culture. Um, and then I think for me, I'm getting to a point in my life where I want to do more than sustain. Like I really want to thrive in, in my culture. So my children are the first in my family um, since you know my great, great, great grandparents to be educated in their native languages and to be educated in these traditional songs and dances on both the Ainu and Kanaka Maoli side, um, you know, in their native language, in our native ways of knowing and sharing this knowledge. Thank you so much. Let's um, let's take one more question as uh, as we approach our closing time. Um, when teaching world history to ninth graders, we focus on world religions. Oftentimes, we talk about Shintoism and Buddhism when talking about Japan. What should I include about Ainu religion in general? Is there any resource you can recommend? I highly recommend anything by written by Ainu people. <laughs> um, there's a lot out there written by non-Ainu scholars. There's a lot that's heavily influenced by the Western Christian missionary lens. I would look at the work of Kayano Shigeru, um, who is an Ainu elder. He wrote um, the book, Our Land Was a Forest. Um, and you know, understand that it's not so much a religion, it is a way of life. It is a worldview. It is a way of finding harmony with the world and, and you know, the, uh, the physical and non-physical elements around you. And it is very different from Shinto and Buddhism. There is a lot of imperialism in Shinto. It's often called, you know, a, a, a religion parallel to the, the, the Ainu worldview, but it's very, very, very different. So I would encourage you to read sources from Ainu people. Um, so uh, Kayano Shigeru, and um, there's a professor in America. Her name is Chisato Kitty, Kitty Dubril, I believe. And you can find you can find her work online. Thank you so much. So interesting. Yep, go ahead. If I can just add really quickly to that, um, that when you teach about world religions, I think it's important to remember that the uh, category of religion and then the category of world religions on top of that um, sort of assumes a like Eurocentric, very Christian definition of what religion is. So, you know, when when Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano said it's not so much a religion as, as a worldview, I think it's important to remember that for a lot of indigenous folks, indigenous communities, the, the way that we engage in spirituality doesn't really align very neatly with how, uh, what the Christian category of religion is. And so when you study religion so often, what, what is caught in the net of world religions are those traditions that align with Christianity to a sufficient degree that we can understand them as being religions. Um, but a lot of indigenous uh, religions and spiritualities uh, and, and ways of being and knowing um, definitely are, um, I think should count as, as religions because they encompass spiritual knowing and spiritual practice. Um, but you might not often hear about them sp spoken about or written about using the word religion. So that's just an important, I think, uh, uh, thing to keep in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Dr. Begay, Dr. Edwards, Dr. Hayashi Simpliciano for joining us today. This was such a unique opportunity to bring together Indigenous scholars from all over the world and grappling similar issues. And uh, it was great to learn about all the multimedia and transnational projects that are going on. And uh, we hope to continue with this um, communication, uh, global communication as we move forward. Um, we will have uh, teacher resources available to attendees today. Um, so please, uh, uh, we'll, we will contact you shortly. And, um, 
and and thank you.